morning and welcome to today's presentation. My name is Michelle Fury. I am the manager in the FICA supervision unit in the conduct of business division in the financial sector conduct authority. Um, I'm privileged today to be joined by Charles Giel, who is a senior specialist in the AML Advisory Unit in the Office of General Counsel of the Financial Conduct Authority. So today we have a presentation planned um, specifically focused on guidance issued by the Financial Intelligence Center as well as a couple of the amendments to the Financial Intelligence Center Act. So in particular with regards to the guidance issued by the Financial Intelligence Center um, that is part of the agenda. We will discuss the function of the, the FIC, the Financial Intelligence Center, um, in issuing this guidance and publishing it, um, trying to explain to you what is the purpose of this guidance and how it could possibly assist you and make you aware of some guidance products that are already out there and um, are currently being developed. In terms of the amendments to the Financial Intelligence Center Act, we want to talk to you about um, specific amendments with regards to um, targeted financial sanctions and automated monitoring systems. And we hope to also give some clarity during the course of our discussion today with regards to what the expectations are of supervisors considering that some amendments came into effect on different dates and there was a grace period that allowed for some transition from the rules-based approach to a risk-based approach in terms of understanding money laundering and terror financing risk. So with that in mind and our agenda explained, we're going to look first of all to the nature of guidance issued by the Financial Intelligence Centre. So with this in mind, I would like to invite Shoal to join the conversation. Um, specifically, I would like to ask him to help us understand why does the FIC issue guidance and what's the purpose of this guidance? And when these guidance products are developed and published, how binding are they in fact to accountable institutions or reporting institutions out there to the extent that is it possible that um, an accountable institution could be sanctioned for not implementing the guidance issued by the FIC. Over to you, Shal. Thanks, Michelle. Yes, uh, I think guidance are very important. Um, it is actually a, one of the mandates of the Financial Intelligence Centre to issue guidance. And you will find in Section 4C of the FIC Act that it's one of the duties of the Financial Intelligence Centre. And that's why you uh, may see that we as the FECA don't issue specific guidance uh, on the FIC Act because it is the Financial Intelligence Center's duty. However, we do work together with the Financial Intelligence Center in issuing guidance. They usually consult us before they issue in guidance. And um, obviously, you know, there's a public consultation process as well. So once they've consulted us on our input in the, the guidance product, uh, it is then published for public comment and you as an accountable institution then can um, make submissions to the FIC with regards to the public compliance communication. Just um, maybe in short, there are two different sets of uh, guidance issued by the Financial Intelligence Centre. It's what we call PCCs or public compliance communications and then there are also guidance notes. So both a PCC or a guidance note are forms of guidance issued by the FIC. The FIC and the FECA, as well as the PA as well, sometimes issue joint guidance. So that's also permissible. And you would have seen from guidance note 7 issued on the risk-based approach and what accountable institutions have to do in risk rating their specific clients. That specific PCC was a joint PCC between the regulators, the FIC, PA and FECA, as well as National Treasury. Now, what is guidance? Guidance is how we as regulators interpret the FIC Act. 
we realize that um, not all of us are lawyers. Sometimes the act is complex. So the FIC issues this guidance to explain in more uh, understandable language what accountable institutions have to do. It is also an interpretation of the act. So although it's our interpretation of the act and, and therefore we will not sanction you specifically for non-compliance with guidance, um, we will sanction you for non-compliance with the FIC Act read with the guidance. So it is very important to understand that difference. Um, so you can't just ignore guidance because it's our view is the regulator's interpretation of what the act is saying. And if you do not comply with the guidance, you do so on, on your own peril. Um, so that's maybe the difference between guidance on the one hand and the act on the other hand. I hope that explains it, Michelle. Definitely, Charlotte. I think um, it's very necessary to to make this or to provide this clarity um, because often in our correspondence and feedback to an accountable institution after a supervisory activity like an inspection, um, we will also often refer to guidance read with uh, the regulatory requirements set out in the FIC Act. So it is very useful, I think, that accountable institutions take note that this guidance is issued, it's there, it explains our understanding and our interpretation, and um, it is written in a, in a way, in a language um, that makes it easier to understand and, and become compliant and ensure compliance. So diving right into guidance products that have been issued, um, by the FIC um, in in the last couple of months or so, um, I think it's it's worthwhile to first look at PCC 48. And um, in this regard, uh, it, it's quite a mouthful, and some people who, who read the guidance um, might also not be completely clear on on what the guidance aims to achieve. Um, and that's why I would like you, Shaw, to help us understand. Um, this particular guidance product and the guidance um, in relation to the importance of understanding money laundering and terror financing risk and performing customer due diligence, especially in respect of a nominated beneficiary. Can you, um, can you tell us more about who this, this, this guidance product applies to and um, that relation to the importance of understanding that MLTF risk and the CDD regarding nominated beneficiaries. Yes, uh, PCC 48 was issued specifically uh, on, on the 31st of March 2020 and it's applicable to your life insurance sector. Uh, and it relates specifically to understanding your risks um, as a life insurer, but also as, as an uh, FSP, a financial service provider, that um, provide advice or intermediary service in, in respect of life insurance products. Now, it's common cause, we all understand it, that accountable institutions, yourself, have to understand your risks um, that the client poses um, with a specific reference to money laundering or terrorist financing. Now, one of the elements that you have to take into account to, to understand your risks. It relates to the nominated beneficiary. Who is the nominated beneficiary? And why is that important? Why uh, do we have to look at nominated beneficiary? It's because there's a single transaction. So as soon as there's a payout um, from the policy to a beneficiary, a single transaction occurs and therefore the FIC Act is applicable to that specific scenario. So you will have to know who the nominated beneficiary is and understand the risk that that person uh, poses for the business relationship or the single transaction. Uh, it's also important that you are obliged to file a suspicious transaction report or the SDR if um, the supervisory, following the request of the supervisory during inspection, determining compliance with the FIC Act in terms of Section 45B. 
Now, I think this is a very important point, Michelle. We, we get it a lot where our accountable institutions tells us, but so what I'm, I'm dealing with, for instance, a, a low risk product. I'm dealing with a funeral policy here, which is generally low risk. So, um, you know, therefore, my risk with the client is also low risk. And that's actually uh, not the correct approach. Uh, a product risk such as funeral policy is only one of the elements that you have to take into account. You cannot base your entire risk assessment of the client just based on the product. You also have to look um, into other aspects as well. For instance, the client type uh, of risk, uh, the jurisdictional risks, and this, this distribution risks. So those are other elements that you have to look at. What the PCC now introduced is maybe a fourth um, area that you have to look at, and that is the risk that the beneficiary poses for the business relationship or single transaction. Yes. Now, a risk determination, uh, when, when does it have to be completed? It has to be completed at onboarding stage, prior to client acceptance. You cannot do it later on, or only when there's, there's a, a payout. That's certainly not what the Act is requiring you to do. It has to be done upfront. So the risk must be assessed upfront. Uh, and also when the client changes its, its um, de details um, in accordance with its ongoing uh, customer due diligence. So when there's a change in, in the nature of the client, when it changes the details, you have to perform ongoing due diligence and see whether you are still understanding the risks that the client poses. You are not allowed to receive any funds with other words, any premiums or payments, unless you have conducted your risk assessment. That also includes payouts. You cannot do a payout if you haven't done your risk assessment of the client, if you haven't concluded your CDD or uh, obligations in terms of the FIC Act. The information about a nominated beneficiary is part of the information relating to the client that needs to be assessed and understand by the client risk. If uh, the, the client then changes its beneficiary, it should be a trigger to conduct uh, ongoing due diligence. Uh, what, what has changed now? You know, why is the client changing its beneficiary? The other thing that the PCC highlights is if the nominated beneficiary is a sanctioned person, in other words, it appears on the UNODC's list. Uh, you are cautioned not to deal with that specific transaction. Because remember, the Act is quite clear. If a person is named on a UNODC sanction list, um, you are not allowed to deal with that specific transaction. You, you should freeze it. Um, that's what the FIC Act is saying. And that's why it's also important to know who the beneficiary is. With a client or family member or close known associate um, to a nominated beneficiary who is a FPPO or a DPIP that is considered high risk, you're also advised to obtain enhanced due diligence for the client. Establish the source of wealth as well as the source of funds of the client and obtain senior management's approval to establish that business relationship. So that's, a, as I say, another element that you have to look at. Um, it's not just product risk, but there's also client risk. Client risk talks to us uh, who's the PIP or the FPPO or DPIP. Um, you know what the acronym stands for, FPPO, foreign, foreign prominent public official or domestic prom prominent influential person. When an accountable institution makes a pound of the life insurance policy, they are entering into a single transaction with that receiver of the funds. The beneficiary becomes then the client of the accountable institution and the resulting the FIC Act obligations then come into effect. In other words, you have to CDD that um, beneficiary. So Charles, it's really, um, I think, very clear that the PCC is not only just explaining the activities such as risk assessment and conducting 
customer due diligence, but also the sequence in which those activities should be conducted. And um, furthermore, it's very clear on specific things that are prohibited, that accountable institutions should not do. So certainly this guidance will be helpful um, for those accountable institutions who are uh, predominantly operating in this um, life insurance sector. That's um, another, another PCC um, that we would like to focus on today deals with the commencement and enforcement of amendments to the FIC Act. Now, Charles, I think um, this is extremely important because, as, as you know, there's been various amendments to the, the Financial Intelligence Centre Act. Um, these amendments came into effect on different dates, uh, majority of them in October 2017, but others on different dates. And what could have um, caused more confusion is we agreed to a grace period basically for accountable institutions to transition from a rules-based to a risk-based environment, specifically in terms of money laundering and terror financing, um, which, which period we used not to enforce um, compliance. But I think it is important that we take this opportunity today to explain to the accountable institutions what exactly is the status quo today? So considering the different dates, the grace period, um, they need to understand as accountable institutions and an industry, as it stands today, what are they supposed to comply with? Which requirements? What is the expectations from the supervisors to make sure that they are in fact compliant um, and they are not sanctioned for non-compliance because there was some confusion or misunderstanding about the dates? Can you, can you help us with that, Sean? Yes, uh, Michelle, that's exactly why PCC 46 was eventually published. Uh, it's a joint PCC between the FECA and the Prudential Authority. It was published on the 30th of March 2020, and it dealt specifically with the commencement enforcement of the amendments to the FIG Act. Now, the PCC should not be read in isolation. We've also, as the FECA, published two publications on our website dealing with the exact same issue. So the FIC is just taking all of these issues together and um, issued this, this PCC. So as you would remember, the uh, duty to conduct custom due diligence came into effect on the 2nd of October 2017. So that was a change from the old rule-based approach to the now risk-based approach. We as the FECA, as well as the PA, gave institutions an 18-month grace period to comply with these provisions, to get their house in order. And then from the 2nd of April 2019, we as the FECA and the PA can technically enforce non-compliance with the provisions. What this PCC makes it clear is that the duty to comply kicked into place on the 2nd of October 2017. So your duty to conduct customer due diligence in, in line with your RMCP, your risk management and compliance program, was introduced as from the 2nd of October 2017. Therefore, you need to comply with these provisions from that specific date. The grace period was only introduced uh, by the PA and the FECA not to enforce but otherwise, we will not issue sanctions uh, during that period. But there is still the obligation on you to conduct the customer due diligence. The, obviously, the 2nd of April 27, uh, 2019 has passed, and we as the FECA can and uh, we will issue sanctions if you are non-compliant with the CDD obligations. And we have done so. And I think if you want more information on sanctions that we've issued, you're welcome to go to our website. You will find the, the sanctions there. What is actually very important in terms of this PCC is that all clients onboarded since the 2nd of October 2017 must be uh, identified and verified. In other words, CDD in line with the RMCP. So if your RMCP was only approved 
in March 2019, you would have to go back uh, to all your class on board it from the 2nd of October 2017 and make sure that all of those class are on board it in line with the uh, your risk management and compliance program. What is also, um, I think, very important is that through time, all your clients, whether they were on board it uh, prior to the 2nd of October 2017 or thereafter, they all need to be uh, identified and verified in line with your RMCP. So this is uh, something that every accountable institution have to work to. But certainly from, from an enforcement point of view, we are looking to enforce or on those institutions that haven't done the CDD in line with the RMSP since the 2nd of October 2017. Thank you, Sean. I think that makes it very clear um, which dates um, have which implications and what the expectations are. And I would encourage the accountable institutions, um, if they are still confused at some level or about a date or an expectation with regards to compliance with the amendments to the FIG Act, that they contact our office and um, rely on, on first-hand feedback that we can give them. Because it does happen sometimes um, if you don't want to ask the supervisor, you ask a friend and the friend doesn't have the correct information, then both of you are wrong. So it's always first prize if you are unsure. Um, make an effort and contact us. Our door is definitely open and we would like to clarify um, the requirements and the, the so that you are certain in the application and you don't expose yourself to sanctions. So that being said, um, and dealing with those uh, PCCs with regards to life insurance and the like, um, the commencement dates, um, I think it's time that we move on to automated transaction monitoring systems. Now, Charles, I'm not sure if um, accountable institutions are well versed in what automated transaction monitoring systems mean, um, but I would like you to, to give them a, a, a brief explanation and perhaps elaborate on the alerts set out in Directive 5 in relation to the reporting obligations on accountable institutions under Section 29 of the Financial Intelligence Centre Act, as well as the proportionality of an ATM rule um, to the money laundering terror financing risk appetite of a particular accountable institution. Yes, um, Directive 5 and PCC 45 deals with the same issue. It's automated transaction monitoring system. So the PCC 45 was also published on the 20th of March 2020. Now, automated transaction monitoring system are usually used by, by the big banks, by the big accountable institutions that have got lots of transactions. So this PCC might not be applicable to all accountable institutions out there. So what this automated transaction monitoring system is, it um, one has to program um, the system to issue certain alerts. With other words, if you if you program the uh, the um, monitoring system to give you an alert if a transaction is above twenty five thousand rand, uh, you will give the institution an alert, and then a person will look at the alert and then will apply his mind to see if that transaction is reportable to the FIC. So that alleviates the duty for a natural person to look at all thousands of transactions happening uh, on a daily basis, for instance, within the bank. So this system kicks out alerts and then a natural person looks at the alerts to see if it may be reportable. So you can write various rules onto the system to give you an alert. Now, what we've seen in, in the past is, uh, in, in strict interpretation of the Act, uh, the institution, you as an accountable institution, have got 15 days or a maximum of 15 days to report a suspicious transaction. Now, that 15 days only starts when that natural person applies his mind 
and a field is suspicious and that needs to be reported. So it, it, it happened that um, alerts will be generated by the systems and it will be neglected for, for days or even weeks thereafter before a natural person looks at the alert. And then the 15 days will only start when that natural person actually uh, applies his mind. So that's not um, what the FIC had in mind. And, and certainly, you know, this is not good for law enforcement as well, because if we're dealing with a suspicious transaction, it has to be reported to the FIC as soon as possible so that they can alert law enforcement to the suspicious transaction and they can do something about it. If it's left um, unattended for too long, you know, it will not reach law enforcement within good time and they won't have time to do anything with regards to that spe specific, spe specific suspicious transaction. So what the PCC now um, tells accountable institutions that uses an automated transaction monitoring system is that you have um, this assistant period, in other words, there's 48 hours that you have from the alert that's been generated to where a natural person is actually looking at the transaction. 48 hours, with other words, you've got two days. And then thereafter, your 15 days will start. Uh, and you have to report in a transaction within that 15 days. The person that's looking at the um, generated alert must be of seniority. In other words, he must be have enough information and uh, seniority and knowledge and oversight to make an informed decision of whether to report a transaction or not. Um, the PCC also says that the reporters are advised to document what the reporters deem to be acceptable conversion rate and the reasons they are in the ATM's methodology of the reporter. Conversion rate is how many of the generated alerts end up being suspicious transaction reports. Now, reporters should also ensure that the ATM rules are proportionate with the reporters' money laundering and terrorist financing risks and the reporters' risk appetite. So you shouldn't, um, when you write your rules, your ATM rules, you need to take that into account. You also need to continuously evaluate your ATM system to make sure it is still relevant. All investigations and decisions taken to alerts generated by the ATM must be documented. So if we as the FECA come to you and say, but why haven't you reported this specific alert? I want to see where you've documented the reason why it wasn't reported. Or even if it was reported, why was it reported to the FIC? The fact that an institution uses an ATM system does not prevent it from receiving manual reports. And it actually should not prevent it from receiving manual reports. So if it's in the banking space, for instance, if you're a teller, you can still report that transaction to the compliance department. So sure, this, this PCC and this guidance, um, if I had to put myself in the shoes of someone who hears it for the first time, um, I really get the sense that the legislation is forward looking in how it incorporates the use of technology, especially when there are very large volumes of clients. But it still gives the assurance that although there is now a reliance on technology, um, where human intervention is required and a, a, a natural person has to react to an alert, um, it definitely has to happen within a certain time frame um, for the reasons you have explained. And I think this gives a lot of concrete clarity to those accountable institutions um, who in fact use ATMs um, to assist them to make sure that they, they still they stay within the parameters of what the legislation intended, particularly with regards to the very important um, Section 29 reporting obligations. Um, as promised in the beginning when we dealt with the agenda, we said that we're going to look at ATMs as well as targeted financial sanctions, Sure. 
loosely referred to or informally referred to targeted financial sanctions as TFS. But I would like us to spend some time on just explaining what what targeted financial sanctions are. Um, I, I, I get the sense that um, there, there may be some uncertainty in regards to um, this perception. Look, there are lists that are on some websites, there are some screening obligations we have to do. But when it, when it comes to practically um, doing that, um, looking at the targeted financial sanction, screening your client base against that, what does that entail? How can you practically do it? Um, and more importantly, can you ask someone else to do it for you? Or must you do it yourself? And lastly, I think something that um, on a practical uh, side really will come to mind um, as an accountable institution doing screening is, while well, I've done the screening now, I found the lists, but now I got a hit. One of my client's names popped up here. What do I do now? So can we can you take us through PCC 44 and how this guidance actually addresses some of these concerns that might be um, top of mind for accountable institutions? Yes, uh, thank you, Michelle. I, I personally like PCC 44 very much. Uh, it deals with targeted financial sanctions. It was published on the 20th of March 2020. Uh, but it aims to set out the difference between targeted financial sanctions and sanctions aimed at combating terrorism and terrorist related activity. And I think uh, from what my experience is, there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to the difference between targeted financial sanctions on the one hand, and on the other hand, sanctions aimed at combating terrorism and terrorist related activity and the duties of accountable institutions in both these um, obligations. So I'm going to first deal with uh, the sanctions aimed at combating terrorism and terrorist related activities. Now, remember, we've got a specific act, the Poktatara Act, that deals with terrorism. It sets out what is terrorist activity and uh, people actually prosecuted under the Poktatara Act, should they commit a terrorist activity as defined within that specific act. Now, Section 4 of the Poktatara Act, read together with Section 15 of that specific act, criminalizing the financing and facilitating of terrorists and related activity, which offenses applies to everyone, not just accountable institutions and reporting institutions. So that's very important. So although some uh, persons may not be terrorists or commit terrorist activities, these specific sections prohibit the financing of terrorism. So if you're a sympathizer and you fund a terrorist or terrorist activity, then you can also be prosecuted under this specific act. Now, in terms of Section 25 of Poktatara, the president of South Africa must give notice when any specific entity is designated in the resolution of the UNSC, that's the United Nations Security Council. Now, such resolutions designate the following sanctioned persons or entities. So we've got ISIL and Al Qaeda, as well as their associated individual groups, undertakings and entities in relation to terrorist financing. So those two groups are the ones that have been designated as terrorist organizations. And uh, people within those terrorist uh, organizations are then therefore listed in, in the lists. Where do I find the list? So the list is published by the president and it's available on the South African Police Services website. And I have this website there on, on the screen. You can go to the South African Police Services website and uh, you can look at the list there. There's also a consolidated list on the UNSC website and I've got the web address there. So if we understand what is a terrorist and terrorism, uh, the next aspect to understand what is targeted financial sanctions. So targeted financial sanctions are sanctions aimed at combating proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, oppressive regimes, and human rights abuses. 
And that's where Section 26A, 26B, and 26C of the FIG Act comes into play. Because they are dealing with targeted financial sanctions. Now, Section 26B, read together with Section 49A of the FIG Act, prohibits the financing of persons or entities who are subject to a targeted financial sanction um, in terms of Section 26 of the FIG Act. Now, in terms of 26A of the FIG Act, the director of the FIG Act must give notice to persons or entities who has been designated as sanctioned persons or entities in a resolution of the UNSC. Such designations are not due to terrorist or related activities, but rather related to threats to international peace and security, which include the prolifer proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, oppressive regimes and human rights abuses, as indicated. So there's a specific uh, section 28 that says that you have to scrutinize your client information to, to make sure or to enable you to determine if your clients are on those lists. The obligation to scrutinize client information only applies to accountable institutions. So although the, the target of financial seeing a regime applies to all institutions, the duty to scrutinize only apply to accountable institutions. The UNSC resolutions that currently form part of the targeted financial sanction um, as at the 10th of December 2019 is, is listed below. Uh, the, the list is, is, is subject to updating, so that list keeps on evolving. So as the um, sanctions are issued, it's uh, published on, on the specific list. Uh, just to give you an indication um, which countries the, the list refer to, um, we've indicated the countries uh, and the relevant Uni United Nations Security Council regulation there. So um, you, we would see Iraq, Ku Kuwait, Sudan and the likes. So in terms of your risk management and compliance program, you need to state the process in how you're going to scrutinize your client information with those lists. The target of financial sanctions in terms of the FIG Act report, the target are not dependent on risk identification. In other words, there's no low, medium or high risk. It's, it's a rule. If the client is on the list, you're not to deal with any assets and need to freeze all property or assets of that specific client. And you need to report that to the FIC as well. So there is no risk-based approach involved. It's certainly a rule. Where do I find the target financial sanction list? You'll find it on the FIC website currently. So if you go to the FIC website, you will find all those uh, target financial sanction lists being published there. So sure, this is, this is obviously a mouthful. But I do think it's important that there is this distinction made between or an accountable institution understands, make sure they understand the difference between a terrorist, terrorist related activities, terrorist financing, proliferation, human rights abuses, and the supporting legislation that speaks to this, um, or is addressed in this PCC, as well as the uh, different reporting obligations, because um, it could be very unforgiving if you get this wrong as an accountable institution and I encourage um, the accountable institutions out there to go and have a look at PCC 44 if there's still any unclarity or uncertainty so that they are sure now they know where to find the answers. Um, again, contact us if you, if you still have questions, um, but this is necessary to understand so that there's no question and your RMCP in fact um, assist you in making the necessary distinctions and doing the relevant screening that's required. Moving then on to guidance products um, that are currently being developed by the Financial Intelligence Center. So there's basically four of them I thought we could quickly have a look at. Um, these are all still in draft, and as you explained earlier, it is the role of the FIC to develop these guidance products. They do it in consultation, 
before they publish the final product. So those we picked that are currently being developed and we look forward to the final product in due course is PCC draft PCC 12A and that relates to using a third party to com perform compliance, which I think is a um, there's much anticipation in waiting for this guidance product because now that we have an amended Financial Intelligence Centre Act and there are no more exemptions, we need to understand what can and cannot be done by a third party um, regarding us asking them to perform our compliance activities um, for us. Similarly, we have PCC 110. 110. That is um, looking at the risks related to geographic locations. Now, as you mentioned, Shaw, there are obviously several risk um, elements such as clients, products and services, distribution channels, um, and location. And this draft PCC is going to zoom in on uh, giving guidance in terms of geographic areas um, in relation to money laundering and terror financing risk. Draft PCC um, 111 is basically dealing with the prevention and the remediation of reporting failures. So I think we all understand and appreciate how significant compliance with our reporting obligations in fact. And that is the financial intelligence that, that really gives the financial intelligence center a purpose for being. Um, that's where it gets analyzed. And if the, the information is not reported um, as it should be, then there is obviously gaps in, in financial intelligence. So sometimes it can happen that the reporting is not done on time or it is not done appropriately and then considered not to be fully reported, which has all kinds of consequences, of course. So I think this, um, and you can elaborate on that, but the PCC is going to aim to assist the, the industry and accountable institutions um, to make sure that they prevent reporting failures, but when there is a reporting failure, they also know um, how to remedy it. And last but not least, to have a quick look at draft PCC 112 that deals with authorized users and underlying clients. And this comes about to give clarity, um, specifically in the authorized user environment, where an authorized user can be approached directly by myself as a client or by myself as a financial service provider acting on behalf or instruction of using my discretion in respect of the investment or the, the, the trade um, of Shoal Hill, for example. So these are some of the products, uh, the guidance products, Shoal, that are upcoming and being developed. Is there any additional um, Comments you want to give or elaborate on any of them, uh, just to yeah. to appetite uh, or to to spice up the appetite of the industry so that they know what's coming and can be excited about it and look forward to uh, using these products when they get published. Yes, um, so um, all of these uh, draft PCCs that you've spoken about, except the last one, PCC one one two, have already been published for public comment. So those PCCs are due to be issued very soon. Um, the PCC 112, and I know there's another one that's currently being worked on, dealing with beneficial ownership, is also currently being drafted, and you should expect a draft being published soon as well. So if you've got comments, if you've got representations to make on those PCCs, please uh, um, go to the FIC's website, see to whom you have to reply to and please submit your your comments uh, so these pcc's um, are all due to be issued and i would expect them all to be issued before the end of march this year um, i think it's very important that um, all of our accountable institutions go to the fixed website uh, on a regular basis to see if there is any new guidance products that's that's being issued not only guidance products, but there are also certain developments in the AML CFD field that is published on the fixed website as well. We as the FECA, we are working together with the FIC 
in order to publish um, or, to, or to duplicate the PCCs that's been published on a fixed website on the FECA's website as well. So we hope to get um, agreement to that uh, later on this year so that you can also go to the FECA's website to read more on these Ghana's products. Well, that will certainly help. It would be like a one-stop shop, I, I suppose. Um, Shell, last but not least, um, and to end on a high note, the Financial Intelligence Centre Act has certain schedules um, to it. And these schedules basically sets out which entities are supervisory bodies, accountable institutions, reporting institutions. But it makes sense that, um, like any other requirements and um, uh, schedules, that the information in these schedules also be reviewed uh, to make sure that who needs to be included is included and, and those who shouldn't be included and the like. So at the moment, the amendments to the schedules um, of the FIC Act are under review. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the considerations um, with regards to inclusions or exclusions or the submissions entailed? And what should the accountable institutions and reporting institutions look forward to um, with regards to these amendments? Yes, there's been a draft amendment that has been published during the course of last year. Uh, which deals with the amendments of the schedules to the FIG Act. Now, it's it's in the course of, of a general revision of, of the FIG Act. Uh, they consider what changes have to be made. Now, some of the changes deal with changes legislation. For instance, we, we were the FSB uh, previously, now with the FECA. And certainly there was also changes in, in, in the law society's um, responsibilities and their act as well. And there are various other acts that have changed, and those changes need to be reflected in the FIC Act schedules. There are also additional categories of accountable institutions that have been added uh, to, the, to the list of accountable institutions. Uh, for instance, we've got credit providers that will now become accountable institutions, and we've also got cryptocurrency exchanges that will become part of accountable institutions. So you can have a look at the list. Uh, there are more uh, categories. Um, we've also seen that, for instance, that motor vehicle dealers, you know, crew grand dealers have been uh, taken away, but there's now one broad category um, that deals with motor vehicle dealers and crew grand dealers, and that's called high value goods dealers. Uh, very interesting um, um, category as well. Uh, some of the other um, changes deals with the uh, removal of certain supervisory bodies, for instance, the IRBA and the provincial law societies um, are being uh, removed as, as supervisory bodies, and the FIC will take over that responsibility. Then uh, there is also a very interesting uh, proposal that, that was published, and that was uh, the amendments to item 8 and 12 uh, of Schedule 1 to the FIG Act. Uh, in the amendments, they wanted to exclude certain classes of life insurance and FSPs from the definition of accountable institutions. Um, now, the FIC and Treasury has received various comments from the public out there. Um, some of these submissions are opposing uh, the exclusion of the categories from the list of life insurance and FSPs. Uh, the FIC and National Treasury are currently considering these submissions. Uh, we are having meetings with them. They are having meetings with industry bodies as well to understand exactly what the, the concerns are. Uh, in red, you will see that our recommendation from the FECA is uh, please continue to comply with the FIC Act as if no changes will be made to item 8 and 12 until the final decision is taken. I must say the, the submissions not to exclude certain categories of life insurance and FSPs are very compelling. So if I had to be a betting man, man, I think that they will not be removed. So please keep on uh, complying with your obligations um, in terms of the FIC Act. 
Um, I think the last uh, point there, you would have seen that non-life insurance or FSP is providing advice in the media service regarding non-life insurance. Um, those categories are, are not going to be included in the FIG Act. There's been a study done by the industry. It came to the conclusion that the risks, money laundering risks are very low there. So for now, there's, there's no plans to include non-life or FSP is providing advice in the immediate service in, in respect of non-life as accountable institutions. Thank you, Shaw. So just to summarize, we've basically today considered guidance issued by the FIC as well as amendments to the Financial Center Act. In particular, we have looked at specific guidance products like PCC 48 in respect of life insurance, PCC 46 regarding the commencement and enforcement of amendments to the FIC Act. We also had a look at Director 5 and PCC 45 regarding automated transaction monitoring systems and importantly Section 44 dealing with targeted financial sanctions. We spoke about a couple of upcoming PCCs that are in draft and we expect to see them um, in their final form soon as well as a quick recap of the, the current review of the schedules of the FIC Act. Um, and like Charles said, please apply um, the law and the, the schedules as it stands currently until it has been amended. I trust that you enjoyed this session. Again, extending an invitation that you contact us if you have any doubt about any requirement or how you should comply or what you should do. Um, better to hear it from the horse's mouth and definitely to encourage you also to visit the website of the Financial Intelligence Center frequently, as well as our website where we have a dedicated AML CFT tab, which we hope to make full of information for you in due course to help you to create awareness um, and to assist you with your compliance and um, to even answer a few anticipated questions that's quite prevalent in the industry. Enjoy the rest of your day. I trust um, that you will stay safe. Thank you.